Kate, to introduce myself. I'm Andrea Petrenki. Uh, I'm the Vice President of Community Learning at Learning Guys, a uh, blockchain security company. Uh, and today I'll be moderating the discussion on the topic uh, Could ZK, UVM, BD, and Aim of Scalability? So I start by asking you to briefly introduce yourself and uh, the products you're working on, and then we will uh, uh, dive deep into uh, today's topic. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Alex Kuchowski, I'm uh, CEO and co-founder of uh, Zip Matter Labs, which is the company behind ZK Sync. Uh, we are uh, building a ZK VM scaling solution for uh, blockchains, and we just launched the very first ZK VM on Ethereum mainnet. Yeah, thanks, my name is Philip. Uh, technical and economics background. I uh, completely pivoted. I used to work in the corporate space of blockchains with Accenture and their multi-party system entity. And we did CBDCs, uh, custody and digital assets. And we helped like some uh, monetary authority of Singapore, uh, Bank of Canada, the digital euro, dollar, etc. Uh, pivoted back to crypto, uh, where I work for Quantum Foundation, which is a cryptocurrency. It's an EVM compatible chain uh, based on a UTXO base. And uh, now I'm here representing Bola VM which is a CK EVM team, uh, where we're quite similar to CK Sync. We have a custom virtual machine, and uh, we're slightly behind in terms of the, the time schedule, but we're getting there, and we're looking to launch our proof of concept soon. Hey everyone, I'm Bractifus. I'm co-founder and CTO at Tyco. Uh, previously, I built a ZK, like a type-specific ZK rollup uh, at Lupa, uh, and now we're building a decentralized Type 1 ZK VM at uh, Tyco. Thank you. Uh, I'm Florian. I work for O of One Labs. We are the company that incubated Mina Protocol. Uh, Mina Protocol is a layer one blockchain which essentially has recursive CK snarks baked into its uh, core infrastructure. It's essentially like a roll up, and we are currently heavily working on the execution layer on top of Mina, which is off chain computed smart contracts called CK apps, and happy to be here. Thank you, thank you all. Uh, it's great to have you here today. So, it's a known fact that zero knowledge has the ability to drastically improve the scalability of blockchains. So, could you illustrate how your projects uh, are um, can help us to pave the way to this ultimate vision, scalability? So, um, I think I'm just going to start. Um, so, Mina itself is already behaving like a roll-up. So. Um, it, it just uses one main snark proof to verify the entire transaction history, which is very scalable. Uh, that allows for many, many use cases, for example, like um, in browser nodes or like mobile nodes, where you can essentially run a full node inside your browser or inside your mobile phone, which gives you direct access to the network. So it's scalable, and you also don't have any third parties uh, attached in between it. So there's like no, uh, I guess. Um, censorship um, issues with that. And then because it uses zero knowledge proofs, we have like an execution layer on top of it. Uh, all those off-chain computed smart contracts and those off-chain computed smart contracts are obviously also very scalable because you don't have to pay, I guess, um, gas or like other fees for the network to do your computation. You can simply do that computation yourself and then you just send a proof to the network saying that you uh, executed a contract in a I guess, correct manner, and then you update the state, so that's already very scalable, and on top of that, you can obviously build many, many cool use cases, uh, some of which might be like application-specific rollups, which are itself already rollups on top of a rollup. Uh, you can have like general purpose rollups, and in, in general, it is um, a very democratized way of proving and, and, I guess, producing proofs, because you can do it yourselves in the browser, so it's like nice and scalable, and easy to verify. Oh. <laughs> so we are talking like a build building uh, layer 2 uh, ZK VM. So for our path forward is like, yeah, developers are used to developing apps for the uh, Ethereum and all EVM compatible chains or EVM equivalent chains. So we are just trying to make that more scalable. Uh, so people just get, yeah, developers are used to certain things, all the, all the, all the gas costs, all the security uh, implications that it provides. Uh, users are used to like, using MetaMask hardware wallets to do, um, yeah, interact with that chain, and we're trying to do exactly that, but just bring it on layer two and like more uh, like scalable, but still keeping the properties of like being decentralized, permissioned, all the important characteristics of a of a of a layer two and a layer one. Uh, so yeah. 
Yeah, I, I can yes to second what the other speakers said here. I, I think one of the key aspects for, for the OLA VM team is adapt developer experience. We want that to be as identical as it is today. We think that's one of the key properties. Um, we are, however, making some fundamental changes under the hood. Uh, the EVM today is stack based, and we're swapping that out completely to be a register based. Uh, I think one of the main components here is that what's the, the purpose of a CPEVM or a scaling solution? And, uh, and that's to really bump the TPS and, and have that 10x, 100x moment in terms of efficiency and, and security, etc. cetera. And uh, we, we're making these changes. Um, it's important to, to have that compatibility as well, which uh, it's really a, a spectrum of trade-offs here. And um, we're, we're making sure to support everything as is with the existing DAP developer ecosystem, whether that's you know, Kanash, Red Hat, the existing wallet ecosystem. Uh, but at the same time, we're increasing the efficiency, which would be one of the core concepts of CPEVM, uh, and that's the premise of our solution. Um, I want to draw also attention to a very important aspect of your knowledge base, which I think is, is the most uh, interesting one in the context of CPEVMs, uh, and that is the recursive comp composability. Uh, because with the like, zero knowledge proofs is the only technology we have today that uh, allows you to uh, to go truly uncapped uh, scalability, and with uh, you can you can verify arbitrary number of transactions. You can go like, truly infinitely in, in, in the in the uh, scale that you can support without giving up the properties of. Every participant verifies every single transaction. Uh, we are leveraging this with ZK Sync in what is going to be the layer freeze, um, where anyone will be able to deploy their own chain, and there will be any number of the chains that can, can support each other and that will be seamlessly talking to each other, creating something like the Internet of Blockchains uh, without like giving up any of the security properties. I think that, that's, that's the most interesting for me in, in the ZK world. Okay, so based on your current pro um, progress in this direction, and also knowing that the equilibrium uh, for supply demand uh, on blockchain has not been found yet, um, how scalable will your product be in a few uh, years from now? So, uh, will, will we be able to, uh, to see a fully on-chain sophisticated uh, logic, um, what is this uh, far away from now? So I, I can begin uh, and, and just root back to what I just said uh, previously with the top layer freeze. Um, any blockchain system that is monolithic can only handle so many transactions. Mm -hmm. like it's not possible. You cannot imagine the internet, the entirety of all the transactions on the internet running on a single server. No matter how powerful that server is, you will have some physical limit of what you can handle there. Uh, but if you have multiple servers running in parallel, then there is no limit, right? The sky's the limit. You can, you can just add more and more capacity and process more uh, requests, uh, add more applications, websites, etc. The same thing is going to happen here. There is no limit. We're limited by the physical number of GPUs in the world, and there will be more of them supporting the ZK uh, provers. Uh, so like, we, we can go infinitely here. But those systems will be connected in a network uh, with composability somewhat impacted by the separation. So the composability will be there, but it will be just a synchronous. It will be slightly different from, from what we, we are used to in the blockchain world today. So the scale is unlimited. The, the UX developer experience will slightly change. Yeah, uh, I, I kind of agree on these points. Uh, I think it's going to be hard to tell you exactly the, the scale of, of improvement we're going to see. It's like how long is a rope? But we're going to see a significant magnitude of, of speed here coming in. And uh, I, I love the uh, asynchronous part here that we're going to see that you can scale this in multiple threads, and that's going to be the real scaling effect that we're going to see coming in. And I think uh, a lot of the CPEVM teams have similar solutions here. There's some slight trade offs here and there that, that we're making. Um, but, but I think Alex, you covered it pretty well. Yeah, I think like in the near future we can get easily like an order of magnitude. Uh, but like Alex said, like while the proving like the proving isn't really the problem because you can just parallelize it, but the actual chain part is like yeah, it has like sequential parts. 
it also like can slow down the like state growth and, and things like that. So there's like a limitation on like uh, okay, the chain itself and like how it is still wanted to be like at least like also like partially like as at least like decentralized enough. Then people need to be able to keep up to date with the, the, the chain. Like you have to be able to sync it with each other and like uh, actually follow them along. Like have a block explorer that follows the chain and stuff like that. So it needs to be if you have like if you want to have like a very scalable chain, then all the other infrastructure around the chain also needs to be scalable. And it's not like just yet yeah, optimizing the or or things like that. So in the short term, like more of and then in the future we can hopefully like increase that a bit more by again focusing on other uh, aspects of the, of the chain. Uh, but yeah, predictions of part of layer trees and things like that is a, a good a good way for potential. So uh, I guess I'm going to um, continue on all those points, essentially what I think will be key in the upcoming years, months, whatever, will be a uh, key number one, or point number one, recursion, right? Just using multiple proofs and merging them into each other, essentially allowing multiple entities to produce proofs and then just simply, I guess, like merging them together. Uh, the second part will be composability, I guess. Uh, so multiple applications and, and talking to each other, interacting with each other, and not only one monolithic, huge piece of blockchain that doesn't really do anything efficiently. So having multiple applications that will be uh, efficiently talking to each other, using recursive proofs and, and things like that. And also uh, point number three would be um, democratizing proof production. So you don't have to rely on an entity, you don't have to rely on like centralized systems, uh, service providers. And you could just do it yourself, essentially. That is also something that I anticipate would be um, very exciting. Thank you. Very insightful. Um, so now that we know how uh, your products are dealing with uh, scalability issues, uh, I would like to discuss some uh, design uh, approaches. So my question is, uh, why did you decide to, to go with uh, EVM or Solidity instead of developing your own uh, virtual machines and then you just Thank you. Yeah, so um, I guess we are not going with CKEVM directly, right? We are not a CKEVM chain, uh, we are not building a CKEVM. We are building essentially our own virtual machine that is running on top of Mina and can be verified using Mina and other ways. Um, there's a reason for that, essentially, Mina itself is, I guess, it can be considered a modular blockchain. It itself is behaving like a roll-up, so it's like light, light bake, it's succinct. And on top of that, we are also not using Solidity or, I guess, you or whatever, like, uh, we are using something called Snarky.js, which is a very nice to use TypeScript framework. And the reason for that is that we want to um, open up the, the web free space, the zero knowledge space to web2 developers that already have JavaScript experience. So if you already know web development, uh, which is, I guess, a very big portion of developers out there, they could just use Snarky.js and they will have to write TypeScript, which isn't, I guess, really hard if you have been working on web development for many, many years. Uh, you can use our framework, Snarky.js, um, and just write zero knowledge circuits with it, recursive proofs, or off-chain smart contracts. So. Um, that's essentially our way of onboarding uh, developers, uh, make, open up the ATC knowledge space just by using, I guess, something that people already use, uh, already know how to use. So there's no, uh, I guess, experience required. You don't have to learn something completely new. You can just rely on your existing knowledge. So yeah, um, at Blueprint, I also built like a that-specific rollup and like. And that means also like creating all the technology, like a lot of the technology. Again, like you have to like run your, like, create your own node, uh, like create your own protocol and things like that. So what we're trying to do with like type one, type one is even so why we chose that is not just because it allows like very easy way for developers to develop on our chain, but also like an easy way for us to reuse a lot of the technology that's already out there, like the battle test and stuff for Ethereum and just reuse as much as possible to just get a very robust chain uh, as soon as possible. And uh, like, I guess we are like more optimistic about ZK rollups than some of the other solutions which like, try to optimize certain parts already. Uh, and, which, and we think that that's probably, well, it will always end up being faster with the optimized sort of things, but we think that eventually with like the proving system, the proving like doing more optimizations on like circuit level and things like that, that it will probably get close enough that it won't merit that much, and so we can just, again, keep doing the same thing as Ethereum, and also like collaborate 
with all the projects doing the same thing, collaborate with like Ethereum itself. So if Ethereum improves, we also improve. It's just kind of like a, 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 a nice way of like collaborating with like layer one to layer two. Like yeah, we improve together, uh, and I think that's also <coughs> the very best. Uh, yeah, at um, Ola VM, we're doing things slightly different. Um, we, we had two main things we were looking at, and that's the, the DAP developer experience, meaning the compatibility. But at the same time, I want to emphasize the speed of a CTEVM, and that's what we're really opting for. Um, if you would compare our solution to, for example, given the PSE team, the Privacy Scaling Exploration team, uh, which are going for the full equivalence of the CTEVM, um, they have about 100 opcodes that they use as support. And do remember that when you have a CPP, you need to prove all those opcodes and that they've been executed in the correct order and the correct amount of opcodes. So what we're doing with our virtual machine is that uh, have a finite field and we've implemented the word. And the word is that the minimal unit of account inside a virtual machine. And uh, we've implemented uh, the word as a field element inside a finite field. And we only have a few arithmetic operations at the construction set, the actual opcodes of the VM. Uh, it's a quite modular approach and we're using them to get the desired effect. And then we have some built-ins for some complex um, opcodes if you have an EVM today. Um, so we don't need support for that. Uh, we have it natively with built-ins. And um, you're going to have some trade-offs here. Uh, what we're doing, we're, we're looking at uh, different algorithms. Uh, you have a lot of CPP algorithms here. Some are based on elliptic curves, some are not. And we're talking about the recurs uh, reverse nets, etc. You have Groth as a, as a 16, as a Stark uh, algorithm. You have the Stark on the opposite side of the spectrum, which is a much larger bite size uh, proof. Um, and we're opting for some kind of a middle ground here. Uh, we're interested in looking into the aspect of cutting, uh, we want a custom CPT algorithm, where you're cutting FFT. Uh, FFT stands for Fast Fourier Transform, and it's commonly used in, in a lot of CPT algorithms. And it's not very scalable. Um, so we're looking to cut this algorithm out of it and purely use MSM, which stands for Multi-Scalar Multiplications. And we believe uh, with a custom algorithm, uh, because MSM is very scalable, you can run it to multiple threads. Uh, so we're, we're releasing our proof of concept and we're looking to scale this using this custom algorithm with a, a specific hardware proof as well in FPGAs. Uh, but when you're doing this, there's also trade offs in this factor of compatibility. Um, but as I mentioned, the DAP developer experience is very important and that's key to us. Uh, so we're still going to be compatible with everything as is today for the Ethereum ecosystem while still getting that better uh, prover, the actual generation of the uh, CKP itself. Um, but do note that uh, we're still supporting everything as is today for the DAP developer experience through interfaces. Um, so we're talking about tooling, uh, the wallet ecosystem, etc. Um, but I, I think the, the key here is that we're looking to have a, a faster CKP generation. Uh, our, our belief at Ola VM is future looking. Uh, we think the EVM will have to adopt over time. Um, even things on the Ethereum roadmap today, such as the Burkle tree, etc., coming into play, you know, they're going to have to make some changes, and we're kind of going into that direction, uh, future-proofing. Yeah, thank you. We, we, you just described the architectural approach, which we also follow. We focus first on building the most CK-friendly, most efficient, most performant virtual machine, which is optimized for CK specifically. So yeah, the, uh, like I said before, like day one, we will be like fully decentralized and, and permissionless, so there's no whitelist or any like blacklists that we will be building into the protocol, so it's anybody will be able to post new transactions and it will just like, get accepted by the chain. So either it's kind of like a block uh, produce, producer that will submit to a transaction, or in the worst case, you can always just submit your transaction yourself uh, and then also prove yourself. So there's like no yeah, permissionless or anything else, so it's kind of like, yeah, just as decentralized and permissionless as, as it is. It's a brilliant question, and I think this is also a key attribute of decentralization. Uh, it's very important, as we've seen with Tornado Cash. Uh, there's many aspects here. Um, I think we, we have shielded transactions uh, as an example there, and I think that's really important. We've heavily studied the Aleo model, and a shout out to them. I think they're doing great work with the Aleo chain. Uh, also, the Zcash model. I think the privacy first and the availability to opt out of the privacy is key here. Um, this also enables for that all the data is shielded, and then if you need to share some data with an AMM or whether you know whatever, whatever DAP it is, you have the option to do so as a user, and I think that's very powerful. And then you also have the decentralizations of the uh, the sequencers or builders, you may call them, and then provers. Um, this is also very important and something we're looking into. We're going to release a yellow paper. We're, we're 
we're describing this more in depth, but the, uh, the short um, answer to how we're dealing with this is that we have proof of validity, uh, validity a consensus mechanism, it's uh, almost like proof of stake. And then we're separating the sequencers or the builders. These are the actors who are um, collecting the transactions and bundling them together in a proposed block. And then the second actor will be the prover, who actually submits the new state and updates it. Uh, and it's, it's good separating these two because, well, should the prover be malicious? Well, you don't need to bundle together a new block. You can just find a new honest prover and they can send that in, submit it in. Um, uh, you're also tackling some other problems in this. Uh, it's too much to cover now, but you're tackling MEV in terms of ordering uh, transactions in an order that's favorable for the sequencer. And also uh, censorship attacks. Um, so these are some of the things we're looking into to make that as decentralized as possible. And you should also remember that when you have a CPEVM, really what you have uh, is some form of centralization. Because you're, you're going to have a smart contract only on Ethereum. That's one of the key differentiators between some of the other uh, scaling solutions that you're staying on Ethereum when you have the security of the base layer of Ethereum. And uh, it, it's a smart contract, it's going to need ownership. You're going to have an address and maybe you're running some kind of multi-sig wallet. Um, these are also uh, delicate problems to tackle. Um, but, but I think that's good to know um, that you have these issues to deal with. You're, you, you can't rely on the, you know, the voting mechanism of Ethereum where the majority decides and forces that way if something happens, you have some form of centralization here. But we're of course looking to make that as decentralized as possible. Uh, for us, it's an extremely important topic. Here, in, in the context of uh, an event dedicated to the idea of sovereign individual, uh, I just I, I want to, to repeat again that our mission is to accelerate the mass adoption of crypto for personal sovereignty, uh, and that uh, that is way more than just decentralization. Decentralization is the means to, to this end to achieve freedom and sovereignty. But it's not. Like it, 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 it is a, a necessary condition. It's hard to conceive a way to achieve sovereignty without decentralization in, in the current state of the art blockchains. But that's not sufficient. We have examples like right now on Ethereum, it's decentralized, but 51% or more of the validators currently support censoring of the transactions from the alpha list with, with regard to. Um, uh, to Tronetica situation. So uh, we believe that those kind of regulations should be happening on an entirely different level and may never touch the core protocols. You might want to, to like if you're if you're trying to regulate the uh, you know the internet space, if you start doing it at ISP level, at the provider level, it's gonna be a disaster very soon. It will very soon lead to a situation of abuse by authorities, by bad actors, by by some officials in, 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 in a certain position. So like, the protocols must remain sacred and fully free, enforced by technology. And this is what we're going to do with CPC. Uh, and it's a challenging situation. It's not enough to say, OK, we're going to decentralize the sequencer, and we're going to decentralize the group generation. We have to understand what are the incentives for different actors to, to be centering, to not be centering. Like, can they dominate the, the validator space and like, force, soft force others into, into this, you know, Ethereum is, for example, taking the uh, uh, the course for its proposal bill of separation, uh, and there might be a situation where five entities or around this number are going to be building all the blocks. Uh, the, the the full validators might not be incentivized enough to listen for all the transactions and like, to try to fetch censorship and, and insert additional transactions. So, like, again, we we we. we might end up in a situation where censorship is prevalent and uh, economically justified. So what we want here is a using cryptography, using some some deeper technologies to make censorship basically impossible at the root. And this is something we're working towards, and we'll be happy to, to share more more details as we uh, come closer to the Okay. Thank you. So somehow on the same idea, I would love to know um, what are your ongoing efforts into assuring security uh, of your uh, of your product, right? Because software has bugs and bugs get exploited and so on. So I'm curious if you like have some automated means of, uh, of doing that, or if there are any benchmarks that can be shared between uh, the key ideas. Um, this is a huge topic, specifically for layer 2s, because we, we do something that runs in 
uh, in the smart contract, which is open and vulnerable, and if there is an exploit, it, 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 it can be irreversible loss, not just a temporary loss of service, but loss of liveness, and actually the loss of the entire fund. Uh, so we, at Educacy, we have an aspiration to uh, uh, do everything possible to make the entire space safe, not just our project, but all the ATL2s that are working on uh, ZK VM, on the layers in general, uh, because an attack on one will be an attack on everyone else. The reputation of everyone else will suffer. If people, you know, like, you, 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 you remember the Zcash situation where they had the the uh, uh, bug in the specification of the trusted setup ceremony, you know, kind of led to, to shaking of the trust. People were like skeptical about Zcash technologies, but those things are inevitable. Like mistakes will happen. You just need layers of layers, like multi-layered approach to security that will. Uh, the, the prevention and mitigation of possible problems like this, and eventually we need to find something that will uh, work. Like we, we need to cooperate with their ones on making some really, really robust. But as like initial steps are, we have a huge budget for security. We just started the uh, code contest on the uh, code for arena, where we, we offer uh, one hundred sixty-five thousand dollars for any box that are found, like regardless of the severity of the box. This is the budget that is going to be spent. So, like, we we are actively incentivizing that. We will have multiple additional. Like, we we're doing two um, security audits with top tier um, uh, security auditing companies in the space uh, for for all parts of the system, for the protocol, for for the circuits, for the cryptography, like basic pro protocol cryptography, and of course for smart contracts, both on layer one and inside layer two. We have some layer two system contracts. Um, and we are just going to lead multiple initiatives that we want to share with all the participants in L2 space to, uh, to make the, the entire space secure and to, to create a feeling of safety for the end users and developers who are deploying it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, I think security uh, is also why we're doing this, right? Uh, we've had scaling in terms of bridges uh, and other L1s, and, and you're never going to be as secure as the weakest link in the system, and I think we've seen tons of bridges being hacked, and I think that's one of the, the good things about um, CK EVMs, relying on the base security of Ethereum. And then, of course, security is going to be massive, and it is for our team as well. Uh, we're working on our proof of concept, so we haven't come to the stage where we're actively working with uh, people vetting the code and going through it. We're doing everything open source. We think that's key. As Alex men mentioned, I think you know coming together as an industry and making sure that everything turns out good is good for all of us. I, I think we're kind of early in, in the stage of CK EVMs, and we're going to see it rapidly developing. And you know, even in the in, in the CK EVM space, we're going to be looking for some kind of standard uh, that we all can use. And uh, security is going to be key here. Yeah, uh, I also want to like stress the, the collaboration, uh, especially. And we are actually like, yeah, that's kind of like how this project started. So we are collaborating directly on the same code base as the Ethereum Foundation uh, uh, privacy scaling uh, explorations and also Scroll. So we are building on the same thing. There's lots of eyes on the same kind of code. We will go doing like audits together and also like working with other projects together to like audit the code really well. Um, and this is kind of like also only possible if you're trying to like try to prove the same thing. Like we kind of like standardize like how Ethereum works. You're all like working together on the same thing. Uh, and that just like allows, allows uh, 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 collaboration out of the box. Uh, and I think like on top of that, like we're just not working on like the same code base, but other projects might have like a prover that takes like a totally different approach to prove the same thing. And then you have like this idea from, from Vitalik that you actually have like a smart contract with like multiple provers that are necessary to be able to verify a block on chain. And that's kind of like, yeah, that's kind of like the, another like a big reason to like just try to standardize like what the EVM is or like what the VM is that you're working on. Uh, because like, yeah, there's like hundreds of people that are trying to improve it here, trying to do the same thing. And it's just like hard to compete against like this kind of like collaboration or like this kind of like brain power behind it here. Thank you. Yeah, there, there are many perspectives from which you can uh, approach this issue. There, I mean, you can approach it from a protocol level, I guess, from the low-level cryptography, but also the, the end developer that wants to develop a smart contract also has to take uh, some security measures into account. Uh, there are, I guess, many many ways of trying to uh, improve security. For, for one, MENA is itself already a layer one, so you already have some, I guess, security baked into that. Uh, but then again, I mean, we are like doing cryptography audits, right? Obviously, of the proof system, 
and we are like trying our best to uh, test it as much as possible on the very low level and then also introducing test nets that, that run all sorts of uh, contracts where developers can try to find bugs and if they find bugs it's awesome there's also a incentivized test net coming up uh, some um, advertisement. <laughs> um, um, other than that, I mean, there's like also a lot of education to be made, right? So your knowledge, especially with a, um, I guess DSL, like we have Snarky.js, where you write your own circuits. There's also a, so zero so knowledge programming is also like a different paradigm of programming. You have to approach your problems from a different perspective. So um, there's also like a lot of education involved. You need to educate the developers what they can do, what is secure, what they shouldn't do. And yeah, so that's one main perspective, I guess. And then obviously audits, right? Um, just making sure that everything is secure from a, I guess, more audit perspective. So. Okay, thank you. Uh, since we are running out of time, um, are there any other exciting things uh, upcoming uh, for your projects that you want to share with us? Um, maybe. Oh, yeah. yeah, so um, really quick, um, there's an incentivized testnet coming up, which is running our execution layer, Snarky.js, off-chain computed smart contracts. Um, then there's a bridge to Ethereum coming up uh, by the Nil Foundation. Uh, there's uh, in-browser and smartphone nodes coming up. And there's also something very exciting coming up uh, called CK Oracles that will allow you to pull in any Web2 data that's essentially secured by HTTPS into your smart contract. And then you will have a proof associated with the uh, data that you can then Used to do some awesome CNOG stuff. So, yeah. And check out our docs, docs.minoprotocol.com. And, yeah. So, we, we recently outsourced uh, basically all our code. Um, so, we don't have like any exciting stuff to share, but you can see uh, directly what we're working on. And so, if you want to help out or like interested, then you just go ahead and like go to the, yeah, to our GitHub and, uh, okay, help out or just read some stuff. Um, yeah, we're releasing our yellow paper soon, hopefully. Uh, as I mentioned, we're in the proof of stage concept, so we're, we're hoping that what we're doing, uh, mixing with the algorithms, will yield uh, and it will be faster in terms of generation. So do keep an eye out for the yellow paper. You can find our white paper at olavm.org. Um, and if you have any inquiries for me or the team, you could reach me at my name, just philip uh, at web3.com. And we're happy to chat with uh, anybody interested. So as I said, last Friday, we released the very first ZKVM on Ethereum mainnet. Uh, it was a 100-day race, which we, we publicly announced it uh, in uh, around ETHCC in, uh, this summer. And we made it day on day, so I'm, I'm very proud of the team. Um, and uh, we announced the, the roadmap and the next steps when it's coming, the first L3 prototype, where certain things uh, will be like, what stages to the actual opening the, of the mainnet to the end users uh, are going to happen. And uh, what I want to say is we will have some very, very interesting news next week. So I encourage you to, to just follow. It's going to be something pretty interesting. Wonderful. Thank you very much for joining us today. And we'll see you today here. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.